This is Roadmap to Resilience, an audio series for professionals and families who are supporting children experiencing stress and trauma. I'm Dr. Julian Ford. And I'm Dr. Amanda Zelahusky. Whether you work with children or you have children of your own, this podcast is for you. For the first part of this audio series, we focused on examining key concepts to help us understand the many ways that children experience trauma and the many ways that they and their families are resilient. In this episode and the next several episodes, we're going to get even more practical. How can we, in the specific roles we fill in a child's life, help to foster resilience? In this episode, we'll be focusing on mental health providers. In subsequent episodes, we'll speak specifically to medical providers, parents, lawyers, and more. And while this episode is specifically for mental health providers, I also think there's a lot that listeners can get out of this if, for example, you're looking for trauma-informed therapy for yourself or your child. We know it can be really challenging or maybe even a bit daunting to find a therapist. So we hope that this episode can give you some insight into the many ways mental health providers help their clients foster resilience. Whether you're a mental health provider or someone who knows or wants to know a mental health provider, I think you're going to find the insights that Dr. Michael Salter is going to provide us really quite remarkable. He's the Scientia Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of New South Wales. If I have no idea what it would look like to seek treatment or what treatment might be like, if I am lucky enough to have access to that, can you just talk about what that journey might look like? So, so typically trauma therapy, and, and I'm speaking to two therapists who know this much better than I do. I'm a criminologist by trade. I just spend a lot of time with therapists. But, you know, typically there, there's a process. Firstly, when we approach a therapist, you know, the most important thing is rapport. The most important thing is finding someone that we connect with, that we feel like we trust, that frankly we feel like we like and they like us back. Um, And so there is a process of finding someone that we're willing to trust and we need to put that effort in. We need to be willing. If we're unwilling to like or trust anyone, then we can't go anywhere. So we need to take that that risk, but also find someone where we feel like that's possible. Um, And then there's a process in therapy, of course, of getting to know one another, but also establishing safety. Um, When people approach a therapist, they might not at that time be physically safe. And, you know, there there might be ongoing sexual exploitation and abuse. They might be in a violent relationship and there might be a lack of inner safety as well. So they might not feel emotionally safe yet. So there's a process of of establishing safety and establishing kind of the boundaries around that in different sorts of ways. You know, once there's that security, then, you know, for a, um, a skillful therapist, there's the opening up and the exploring of the trauma itself in different sorts of ways. Um, you know, in the past, I think in the bad old days, there was a, a lack of sensitivity to just how flooding that work can be and how overwhelming that work can be. And I think we're now, you know, much more sensitive to taking people at a pace that's safe for them so that they can still live their lives, but also, you know, process trauma. And it's always really wonderful to hear from survivors. And I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who's going through trauma therapy at And she was sort of talking about bringing this thing up in therapy that she was so ashamed of and so worried about. And the response of the therapist was she just couldn't have imagined it. The the therapist was just had a totally different reaction to what she'd thought anyone would would react when she when she disclosed Um, and just how freeing that was for her. You know, it was just so incredible. So these are the sorts of breakthroughs that we sort of see in this period of time. Um, And as people start to kind of mentalize and metabolize their trauma, and then there's a process of kind of what next, you know, as that more intensive trauma work comes to an end. um, And then kind of what next, what sort of life do I want to live? What's possible for me now that I've um, put some of these things behind me and, and also built skills, you know, there's much more of a focus now on skills building in the context of therapy so that, you know, okay, I still feel shame, but I've got the skills to tolerate shame and manage shame. It's not paralyzing for me anymore. I'm not terrified of conflict in the way that I was. And those skills continue, you know, long time after therapy might have come to an end. So that process for some people might be a couple of years, it might be five years. For some people, they're going to need long-term 
support, they might need to still be talking to someone for 10 years or, or sometimes for 20 years in really acute cases. But undoubtedly what we see is improvements in quality of life when people get effective um, trauma therapy, improvements in quality of life, reductions in hospitalizations, reductions in self-harm, reductions in suicidality. And those sorts of things are happening relatively quickly, you know, within six to 12 months of the onset of, of therapy. Um, and so it's really wonderful to be able to sort of take that story out and to tell that to, to trauma survivors. But the process of starting that journey, finding the right person to go on that journey with you, that's a really important one. That was a wonderful description. Oh my gosh. <laughs> see, do you see why I asked you that, Michael? Like, because <laughs> therapists sometimes don't know how to get out of their own way and explain it as beautifully as you just did. That was one of the best explanations I've heard of, of the trauma therapy mm-hmm. process in a long time. I've only done two years of clinical work, but I have learned a a lot about just what trauma in children can look like and how it's really such a broad term. And so treating a child with trauma is going to look different each time. This is Nicole LaPlena, a fourth year graduate student in the clinical psychology doctoral program at Miami University. So one of the most important things that I've learned is really the importance of the therapeutic relationship when working with traumatized children and adolescents. I think that initially I wanted to jump right into, oh, you know, let's start working on skills and let's start talking about this thing that happened to you. And what I really have learned is just that relationship is such an anchor and it's so important to have a really solid therapeutic relationship before a kid will even really want to open up to you with some of that information, which that might be kind of common sense, but I really wanted to jump right into treatment initially. And that was just one of the main things that I've learned. Something else that I've learned is just how the therapeutic relationship itself can be a resiliency factor, it seems, in some of these kids and adolescents. So maybe where they're coming from in their context, they really don't have that many support people. You might be more important than you think you are is another thing that I have learned. Nicole, because the therapeutic relationship is so important and because we just by being a supportive person with a, a child who may be recovering from trauma can make a big difference, what, what do you do to develop a therapeutic relationship with, with the children with whom you work? I really like to just play games with the kids and adolescents. Depending on the age range, it really looks different. I found Uno is really a hit with adolescents, which is cool. Um, and then younger kids, even just asking them about their pets or you know their school or what hobbies they like just those really casual, fun conversations and just really giving the the child and adolescent your undivided attention and showing interest in what they're interested in and just seeing how that really helps them kind of trust you and it helps really build the relationship. I think that the main tool that we therapists have is not the kind of therapeutic model that you embrace, but rather your attitude towards this child. This is Dr. Sandra Baita, a clinical psychologist and child therapist who worked with public agencies of the city of Buenos Aires for 15 years and now has her own private practice. I believe that children, when they go to a therapist, they are waiting for another adult to be with them, dismissive or angry at them, or judgmental. So one of the first things that I do, even the first time I meet them, we start, to, you know, small talking like, do you like in here? Are you comfortable sitting there? Did you take a snack? Do you want to a glass of water? Do you want to go to the bathroom? Just something that is casual rather than, you know, too serious and, whoa, she's going to bite me. And after that, we introduce ourselves And at some point during this first meeting, what I do is to tell them that I know that probably you have far better things to do than being here. (laughs) So adolescents say yes. Uh, Younger kids, they just kind of, can I say yes? (laughs) If I were you, I would love to be taking an ice cream, probably chocolate (laughs) ice cream. They say, yes, a strawberry one. So yeah, I know. I know. 
So you know what? Since I know that this is something that you don't like too much, I will tell you what I do because we need to help your brain feel good enough here. So if I don't talk at all about what happened, your brain will feel like she doesn't care. And if I spend all the time talking about what happened, your brain will want to hide because she's pushing too hard. So do you know what we are going to do? We are going to get into the things that happen and then out for just a break and then in and out. So this is the first moment in which I see the child just kind of, Hmm. when I can be coherent with that, there is a point in which they just start talking. And something else that I like to do is just tell them, instead of telling them probably that there is a struggle within you between not wanting to know, wanting to know, wanting to tell, not wanting to tell, feeling afraid of. What I have learned from other kids is that sometimes there is a strong feel inside that I just want to talk. And there is a force that says, hold on, what are you doing? And probably there is something that says, I don't know who who this lady is. So let's wait a little bit more and see if we can trust her. The fact is that the owner of your mind is you, not me. If you feel like there is something inside of you that says, hold on, just make a signal and I will just zip my mouth. Okay. (laughs) So I just present to them the possible scenarios that I know that will unfold in front of me. That is the first thing. It's like, I know what might happen and I give you permission to stop me. The second thing is, the child stops me, I have to stop. So when the children feel like they are just talking to an adult that is being respectful to them, they open up, even to tell the most terrible things. Like, I'm afraid that you are going to punish me for what I'm going to say. I have no reason to punish you. But if you feel that you cannot tell me this, there are some other ways in which we can try. You can write it now that we are Zooming our lives. It's like you can use the Zoom chat. Do you want me to, I don't look at you. Do you want me to turn off my camera? Do you want me to take a puppet so you can talk to the puppet and I'm not on the screen? There are a thousand of ways in which you can help a child or an adolescent to talk. Because children and adolescents are very, very sensitive to the honesty of therapists. And this may be one of the first times that that child has has had anyone say, we can talk together and you can choose how to talk to me about this, when to talk to me about this, how much, when to stop. So I think that's, a, that's a, just a wonderful description of how, without giving the child a lecture and saying, now, I want you to be in control of everything here, and I want you to feel like you, you have the power to make your own choices, and you can, you can do what you want. You're, you're showing them that it's possible to go to a memory that they've been trying to suppress, avoid, not think about, not talk about, and to choose to share that but on their own terms and with a, with, with an ever present escape hatch. Yeah. And I really like how you are naming some of the maybe really dark or scary thoughts or questions they might be having and putting that out there so that they see like, it is okay. She's, she's okay. If I say the things that are really going on in my head. When we work with children in a mental health context, we're also often directly or indirectly engaging with the child's family members. Here's a part of our conversation with Karen Silverstein, who's a licensed clinical social worker and practicing psychotherapist. So you've spoken about how parents can sometimes actually be overburdened by the interventions, which are, you know, well-intentioned. So how do we not overburden parents as well-meaning mental health professionals? I think we really have to talk to them about what's reasonable. There is, again, this cultural sense of you have to do everything you can. But at some point, a a child, for instance, that needs psychotherapy and physical therapy and occupational therapy 
and who knows what else down the line. You know, there's not enough hours in the day and the child is exhausted as well as the parent. And sometimes we have to say, let's think about what the priorities are. Let's break this down. What do you really need? What can you do? Let's be realistic and decide where to go with this and help them think it through. This last year and a half uh, challenged us to be more flexible. This is researcher and clinical psychologist, Dr. April Alexander, who is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Professional Psychology at the University of Denver. For the longest, I think even in our clinic, we made excuses for why we weren't engaging in like telehealth. Oh, that's too complicated. Oh, we can't do this, that, and the other. But when COVID-19 shut everything down, we were forced to change over. And that gave us more flexibility to work with parents on their schedule, to be online, uh, eliminating transportation issues, which was so important for so many communities. Um, so everything we said we couldn't do, we now were able to do online and do so fairly well, we learned through this last year. Yeah, we could have listened to families a long time ago about um, how do we better eliminate some of those barriers to access um, in our systems, but we didn't. Uh, and so I hope we don't lose that going forward uh, of just, uh, again, erasing their voices. What are some things when, when I think about when I was beginning clinical work, right? I thought there were all these things I was supposed to, to teach them and guide them on. And of course, the reverse was true. There was so much more that they taught me. And so I just was sort of curious of, of any examples or experiences you've had where you thought you were going in to do certain things or teach certain things and, and actually the reverse happened. Yeah, so I currently am working with a, a juvenile justice population. And of course, as we know, there's a lot of trauma in the history of kids who end up in the juvenile justice system. And I remember I was assigned a new client and there had been a recent sudden death, like a traumatic grief experience. Um, and I really thought that our work would talk about that and that would be something that we were, would work through. And surprisingly to me, that really, it hardly came up just because there was so much other stuff going on in his life. Although that was really difficult for him and that was really stressful for him and it was traumatic for him, there was so many other things going on and he was so concerned about his own safety and the safety of other family members that that really was not the focus of our treatment. That's a great example, Nicole. So even though traumatic grief was probably playing a role in that young man's life, what he wanted to talk about and what he wanted to help with were some of the other concerns he had about safety. And that makes so much sense that it's a terrible loss when someone close to you dies or worse yet is, actually, is harmed and dies. But it also is a challenge to safety. So that's a great reminder that what we might think of as, oh, this is a grief case, might actually involve grief, but it might also involve some of the other aspects of post-traumatic reactions like fear, concern about safety, vigilance, maybe even feeling shut down and just kind of like you, you don't have any feelings at all because it's so awful. That's a wonderful reminder that we shouldn't just jump right into what we think is the primary trauma or post-traumatic stress issue, but really get to know the boy or the girl. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with kids and adolescents, that's particularly important because sometimes it's the parent or somebody else who's referring them to you, and they might have an idea of what they think the kid should be working on. Or even when I've done the trauma screeners with the parent, and then I do it with the kid, they are marking different things as being traumatic for the child. And so that's why it's so important to get that child's input. For survivors of trauma, there can be really difficult psychological and social hurdles to overcome in the process toward healing. For the survivors of sexual abuse that Dr. Salter frequently works with, shame can be one of those major hurdles. For a survivor who feels a deep sense of shame, can it be frightening to even consider the possibility that I'm actually a, a, a person who is worth respect mm -hmm. and who is actually a good person? Shame is protective to a certain extent. You know, shame is a defense mechanism. If we, if we hate ourselves, if we're ashamed of ourselves, if we berate ourselves, then, you know, we're not risking 
hope, you know, we're not risking faith, you know, often people who are deeply shamed are people that have reached out many times and they've had that hand slapped back. And, th and that's, we know how painful and traumatic that is. And so shame has a protective function and it's scary sometimes to let go of shame. Um, it's scary sometimes to venture back out into the world and risk connecting with, with other people. Uh, and I suppose our key message to survivors is that that risk is worth it and that there are people out there who will care about you and who will help you heal um, and that we're so sorry that this has happened to you in the past. But if they're willing to take that risk for us, then we'll make that risk worth it for them. But, you know, shame is, has that protective role and it shuts people down and, and they do need to take that risk to connect with us. And when, when they do take that risk, we need to honour what they're doing because it's incredibly brave to trust again. And maybe we as therapists need to understand that at times people who've been, been shamed may have a kind of a, an allergic reaction to praise, to validation, to recognition. It's, it's like water for someone who's coming in from the desert. It can be very painful to drink, even if it's life-giving. There's a survivor who, in, in one study, I, I spoke to her for about 20 hours, not in a row, but over <laughs> many <laughs> sessions. Um, she had so much to talk about. And since then, she's engaged with a, a couple of my PhD students in, in research. And she's such an impressive person, you know, I mean, her, her life has just been incredibly difficult and she's such a likable person as well um, and such a moral person. And it's really interesting because, I mean, in even in interview, just in a research interview, you know, often I've responded to her with that reflection, you know, that's really strong, that's really impressive, I'm, I'm so impressed. And she hates it. <laughs> and, and it's funny speaking to my PhD students because they have the same reaction. I mean, she's such a likable person and she can't hear it from us. She just can't hear it from us. Um, and so you're absolutely right, Julian, you know, that it can be really hard for chronically traumatised and, and ashamed people to hear that. And, and it can be really overwhelming. Not, it's not necessarily helpful but at the same time, I don't want to stop. You know, I think it's really uh, just to be authentic with someone about how we respond to them. And I do think we don't want to overwhelm them. But at the same time, I, I think there's often a part of them that is hearing that, even if they're not necessarily reacting, there is a part of them that's hearing, hearing what we're saying. And maybe we just need to be careful to provide that validation and that recognition in small drips, mm. just like small sips of water for someone who's been out in the desert. The water takes hold, but it, it has to be done in very small amounts and very carefully. I think that's very wise. And how do we create the opportunity for them to see themselves in the way that we see them? And it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, through praise, you know, it can be in all sorts of small ways, but for them to kind of look in the mirror that we provide and see a different sort of reflection. I really appreciated Dr. Salter's call to be authentic in the ways we respond. So the clients we speak with, whether they are children, youth, or adults, benefit not only from our expertise as mental health providers, but also from our willingness to create a safe and supportive space with them by really trying to connect on an authentic and human level. It reminds me of another conversation we had with social entrepreneur, community organizer, and leader in the fight to end youth incarceration, Hernan Carvente Martinez. Hernan is the founder and CEO of Healing Ninjas Incorporated, which is a tech and media company that's developing tools and resources for people on their healing journeys. So how can people in the mental health field be of most help to, to those of you who are, in, who are doing legal and advocacy work? What can we do to help? It's really important right now for mental health professionals to just use their platforms if they are out there right now to uplift very visibly the issues that are causing this trauma in our communities, right? Like there is such a powerful voice in the mental health community right now that could be uplifted and used for that purpose and, and really trying to shift the conversation from a topic of, of incarceration to one of more public health. I think that that's a really important role that mental health experts and, and just people at large within the field uh, can play. I also think that one of the things that I've come to, to see more is we need mental health professionals to also show their humanity too and, and not forget that as they're doing this work. Um, I feel like once you have the 
you know, LMSW, LCSW, the, the MD behind your name, that at some points you get so caught up in the theory that you forget that the individual who you're working with is like still going through this every day and doesn't always understand all this jargon that we throw at them. And so I've met clinicians and people in the mental health industry who are very heavy on jargon. And the ones that I've seen most effective are the ones that are just like down to earth, real, keep to the practice, obviously, and the boundary setting and all the things that protect them, but still are able to connect on such a real level. And I just want to like remind mental health professionals to to keep it real. Because even myself, I have a therapist. I've been in therapy now for a little over two and a half years now, every week for two and a half years. And part of what I have learned from my two different therapists that I've had in that time is that the only way that I was able to get them to be effective with me was telling them straight up, I don't need the flowery bullshit. I need you to talk to me like a human being. So keep it real with me because I need that intentional raw support not what is in a textbook. Like I need to have a, what is in the textbook in terms of theory and, and framework, but I don't need that to be thrown at me when I'm trying to look at myself and trying to help myself as I'm figuring out the trauma that I've gone through. My name is Dr. Juliana Silberg. I'm a clinical child psychologist and I specialize in the assessment and the treatment of children who've undergone severe forms of trauma and often have dissociative symptoms or disorders. Be totally honest here. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had clients where I thought I wasn't going to be able to help them in, in spite of my best efforts. Have you had experiences like that? Or has every child who you've met just seemed like someone you could work with? I think there, there are some kids that I haven't been able to work with. And I, sometimes it's surprising. Um, I remember a kid a long time ago, and I and I told her she was 12 at the time, and her parents asked me to be her therapist, and she was extremely suicidal. And I said to her, your parents have asked me to be your therapist. I met her in the hospital, and I said, and I don't know if I can do it. I said, I'm afraid. I said this to her. I said, I'm afraid to be your therapist. She said, you're afraid to be my therapist? Why? I said, well, I, I get a sense of you. You're extremely independent. You're very suicidal. You're telling everyone you're going to harm yourself. I know ultimately I cannot stop you. And I know that if I get involved with you, I'm going to really like you and it's going to break my heart. So I'm a little afraid to do it. But I, you know, I'm thinking about it. So she said, please be my therapist. She said, no one was ever that honest with me before. So we had a nice long therapeutic relationship. And what I, I guess one of the reasons I wanted to tell that story is, if you do feel like you're not helping your client, like I wasn't even sure I should be your therapist, tell your client, say, I feel like we're not getting anywhere. Haven't we been talking about the same story for like five months? Are you feeling it? Like I'm feeling it. Like, why aren't we getting anywhere? Let's try to figure it out. So that's okay too. Sometimes I've referred a, a client to somebody who has, you know, kind of a different style than I have. I tend to be very pushy, even though I'm kind, I'm pushy and I'm blunt, I think I want someone a little bit different. So no, it's okay. You don't have to help everybody. Did that answer it? That did. Thank oh my you. God, that was such a great answer. Yes. I just wanted to applaud, but I felt like that would be weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was a great answer. But I, I mean, I think Julian's reminder is really important too. There are going to be cases that aren't appropriate for us to take, or we, we don't have the training yet. So I, I really appreciate your encouragement um, and inspiration to clinicians to, you know, don't necessarily refer these cases out because you're scared, go and get the training. But there are cases where it is serious enough that I'm, I'm not the best fit right now and I could potentially cause harm. So it's important to sort of consult with others, whether that's your supervisor or colleagues to figure out, I'd like to take this case. I think it could make sense to, is that the best fit for this client though right now? Right, you have to, absolutely, you have to analyze that. And I wanna highlight some, a couple of things that you just said, Joy, because I don't want anyone to miss them. When you told that young woman that you were scared to be her therapist, you didn't just say, I'm scared to be your therapist because you're so suicidal, so I'm not gonna be your therapist. You Instead, you said, I see you as someone who has some wonderful qualities and someone to whom I'm gonna probably develop a, a relationship where I'm going to care about you. 
I, I'm a therapist. I'm not your parent. I'm not your friend, but I'm going to care about you. And that's what I'm scared of. I'm not scared of you. And I'm not scared of doing therapy with you. I'm scared that I might not be able to help you master the challenges you're dealing with because you have so many strengths and you're so determined and you're someone I could really care about. What, what a message that is to, to a young person or a person of any age. That's not saying you're an untreatable client. That's saying you're a person who has such great value that I would not ever want to lose you. And that's what I'm concerned about. My guess is that probably that's what a lot of people in that young woman, that girl's life were telling her, but they were probably telling her in a way where it sounded to her like, I don't want to deal with you. You're too hard. You're too, you're too, you're scary. Mm -hmm. As opposed to you're so important and you have so many good qualities. That reframe that you just did, that's probably worth many years of therapy. And I hope everybody caught that. So for mental health providers that are working with complex trauma, particularly dissociation, what advice or words of encouragement would you share? I just want to tell people that the work can be so rewarding and that they, are, they should not keep referring out these kids from their practice. They should just go get training and get a supervisor and try to keep these kids in their practice. And that it's just some of the most rewarding work that you can ever do is work with these young people who have needed to cope with these really extreme, it seem extreme, but as you understand them, they make perfect sense. A life worth living is possible for everyone, but we all have a responsibility to make that possible. I think that genuine interest, you know, I think that is something that we can express in all sorts of ways that not necessarily through praise, but just that genuine curiosity about someone's inner world, their inner life, their skills, their aptitudes, drawing that out of people. Um, you know, all of these things start to build up a reflection where someone starts to see themselves very differently. But for someone who's been chronically maltreated, that is a very, very slow process, you know, sometimes agonisingly, mm -hmm. agonisingly slow. Um, but you know, you see people flourish, you see them flourish, it's slow and it's, um, it's incremental, but in this area of work, sometimes going slow is going fast. You know, Amanda, as I think about these wonderful conversations, one of the things that really strikes home for me is how difficult it is for a child to truly come through the kind of shame that can occur when they've experienced sexual abuse or, or other kinds of trauma. And the sensitivity with which our experts have described the way in which they engage with children and, and help children to see themselves as the kinds of people who have nothing to be ashamed of, but who've been through some, some really, really scary or upsetting experiences. I think that really gets to the heart of what we're doing in all of our mental health work. And it's what I always want to try to keep in mind as a therapist, that job one is making sure that I let that child know that she or he is someone who has tremendous worth. And if they feel ashamed, if they feel scared, if they feel hurt or angry, that that's part of the recovery process and that's part of resilience. And it's not something about them that's bad. It's something that's happened to them. Yeah, I, as I think about these conversations and right, also what you've shared about your experiences too, it, it reminds me of just how humbling this work is. I'm always so moved and humbled by the many ways that children and their caregivers trust us to walk these journeys with them and their ability to share with us what's happened to them and then to trust that we will continue to walk with them on these journeys and, and find ways to collaborate and work together to strengthen resilience and, and help them carve whatever the path forward looks like. So I'm just so deeply humbled and I know we all feel so privileged to work in these spaces and I really appreciated the honesty and candor of our guests in sharing how they walk these journeys with many of the folks that they work with. 
Many thanks to our guest experts on this episode, Dr. April Alexander, Dr. Sandra Baita, Hernan Carvente Martinez, Nicole La Plena, Dr. Michael Salter, Dr. Joanna Silberg, Dr. Viola Von Eden, and Karen Zilberstein. Visit RoadmapToResilience.org to learn more about our guest experts, access additional videos and resources, or send us a message. If this episode piqued your interest, we'd love for you to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and let us know what you think. And if you imagine this episode would resonate with a colleague or friend, please share it. Roadmap to Resilience is a collaboration between Pandemic Parenting and the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, with special thanks to the Interorganizational Child Trauma Task Force. Roadmap to Resilience is produced by my co-host, Dr. Julian Ford, myself, Dr. Amanda Zelahusky, along with Carmen Vincent and Victoria Bruick. Many thanks to Jennifer Valentine for her strategic support and to the teams at Pandemic Parenting and the Center for the Treatment of Developmental Trauma Disorders for providing promotional support. We'd also like to thank the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's National Child Traumatic Stress Network for their financial support of this project. Thank you for joining us in supporting children in need of a roadmap to resilience.